Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. In a bid to address the persistent issue of prison overcrowding, Home Minister Safuddin Nasjan Ismail says the government has agreed in principle to implement the licensed release of prisoners. Now, this initiative means that uh, aims at granting home detention to a specific category of prisoners. Those include um, those serving prison sentences of four years and below, individuals with chronic illnesses and the elderly, people with disabilities, as well as expectant mothers. Now, this move has been lauded as a step towards prison reform. However, it has sparked some concerns regarding potential favoritism, um, favoritism towards privileged and or influential individuals who have been convicted of crimes. So the discussions of home, inten uh, home detention has intensified recently and the questions are, ha questions have been raised about the necessary safeguards and conditions that are required for its successful implementation. So joining us today to discuss this further is Gerald Joseph. He is chair of the advocacy group CSO Platform for Reform. He was also a Suhakam commissioner from 2016 to 2022. Gerald, thank you so much for being on the show with me to share some of your insights. I'm just wondering if we could start with getting your uh, your take or your views on the this initiative, the licensed release of prisoners. Is it a step in the right direction? Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, this initiative of license uh, release prisons initiative in PBSL, the Malay acronym, uh, has been around for some years. Uh, I was a member of the committee when I was in uh, Stockholm, invited to join. The, the, the chair is the director general. So I think this is not a new initiative uh, of, of trying to uh, verify and check who qualifies and who, who doesn't. And I, I think this is the, the way society should go. Um, uh, the difference is that even if you are released, uh, so you qualify for this, you are still uh, a prisoner, convicted, uh, you know, nothing changes in terms of your state. People don't fear that all this will wipe out the, uh, the branding of them having gone to the process. It's not. Uh, so, uh, so that is uh, a way to, of course, the greatest motivation is number one, we have overcrowded, which we've had in many periods of our, of our prison history. Uh, number two, uh, the question is uh, can people be given a chance to hasten their reform and reintegration process into society? And usually, uh, a prison environment is a good punish, punishing environment. And I think that's why uh, people pay for their crime, because they've done something wrong against the law. But I think towards the end, when you have served the bulk of your, your sentence, and then you're not deemed to be a threat to society. Uh, and, uh, and there's a criteria for this, uh, which I'll go into later. Then I think uh, releasing them and they have the last one year left or a few more months left uh, actually is a good way to encourage and motivate them in terms of the process of getting them back into society. And I think this committee does not release anyone like, okay, please go ahead, bye bye, take care. They don't do that. Uh, there's uh, quite a good uh, check uh, list that the prison officers do. Uh, the 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 prior list is while you're inside but also uh when we were there they were very strict in finding they have to answer two questions where are they going to live once they have been released and do they have an economic opportunity mean a job waiting for them these two criteria are very strong criteria and the prison department really tries to find a home and some families don't take their children back home uh, for a variety of reasons, including trouble, stigma, difficulty, but also sometimes not able because it could be a very old grandfather or grandmother in one house and cannot able to, but also many times uh, some are re repeating offenders who so say, ah, you know, I cannot handle it. But the, uh, so finding where do they stay, halfway home? And then the second question is, is there a job waiting for them? Because there's no point releasing somebody 
to get a fresh breath of air in open society, only to be desperate enough to be lured back into uh, criminal activity. So I think there is a very strict criteria on this, and I think uh, for us, uh, society, uh, second chance for someone to come out of that loop of criminality and get back to society is something we should encourage. I think this does that in the long run. Right. Gerald, so you point to the fact that this is a, a good in initiative, but it also rests on the um, the way it's executed, right? The uh, the criteria, the selection of who gets to um, uh, to to be released into home arrest or home detention. Um, those concerns that it were it might be abused, that, that there could be favoritism in the picking of the privileged and the influential. Um, those who are privileged and influential and serving prison sentences, I mean, to be bluntly concerned that Najib Raza might um, ha have his, might be allowed to serve the remainder of his jail term under house arrest. What safeguards would you like to see in place to prevent abuse or manipulation of this initiative, to ensure that it is effective in its implementation? I think the criteria should be uh, fair across the board. So I think uh, you can, the prison department can release how they manage this when I was in the committee. And I think the committee continues now very efficiently. Uh, I think, and you mentioned it, Melissa, in your beginning statement that the minister has said uh, those have one more year of the sentence to serve. Uh, their actual conviction has only allowed them four years or below uh, of sentencing. Uh, so it's a one to three years kind of uh, crime, which is supposed to be a, a small, smaller crime. So, uh, and uh, that answers the, the biggest question everybody has been reacting to, you know, uh, our former Prime Minister Najib, will he qualify for this? But just going by this criteria, he does not, you know, he's got a 12-year conviction or even with the 50% discount by the pardons board, it's still six years. Eh? So it doesn't qualify for this even on the first criteria. And I think the other criteria, uh, critical illness, pregnant women, elderly, also needs to follow that original criteria because it's not for anyone and everybody because everybody uh, who are older can get sick. And so that's not the logic of, you know, you're going in sick and then you get released uh, because you're, you're not well. So, so I think this, uh, if this criteria is followed fairly across the board, and when I was in the committee, actually the thousands of names that we review every month is actually people who are uh, former drug addicts, uh, minor thefts, um, there was one or two cases of uh, domestic violence abuse, and that one, there's a lot of questions of, is the Jabatan Kabajikan involved in ensuring, you know, uh, protection and where is he going back to his wife or not? So I think those are the kind of uh, convictions where, is, uh, where your jail term is, as I say, uh, one to three years, you know, and that's the only one that qualifies. And they start getting reviewed by the committee when they come down to about 12 more months before release. That's when the committee activates. So you don't get the the, the review at the, at the first part of your of your conviction. So I think if it's a fair across the board criteria, I don't think there will be any uh, gray area. So I think if you if we worry about uh, privileged uh, individuals who are jail, like former prime ministers, then that should not be the case. It just should be come up. The director general will say this is the criteria. And more recently. He was defending the prison system against giving uh, special uh, treatment to the former prime minister. Is it no? It's across the board. But all this needs to be uh, needs to be uh, proved through methods, mechanisms of the prison order, and uh, check and balance. You know, so oversight. You know, so I think. Uh, well, I'm not in Suakam, but the Suakam can definitely go and check in on. Uh, Prime Minister Najib to see whether he's getting special privileges or not. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right. That has been, um, I guess, the centre of attention, particularly around discourse over this uh, licence release of prison. I want to ask you, Gerald, um, how important is getting public buy-in for this? Are there concerns that there could be backlash over this initiative? You pointed to the fact that this is kind of this is in line with. Um, the, the humane treatment of, of those who have been convicted and served their sentence. How, what would you like the public to understand about uh, home detention or, or the license release of prisoners? 
I think the first uh, the first uh, question that begs to be answered is that society was never interested in prisoners' issues of welfare. We are most happy for any prisoner to be caught, thrown in jail, and throw the key and lock. You know, so to speak, uh, very broadly. Uh, I think it's time we take we meaning society takes co-responsibility of why so many end up in prison. We find ourselves that burden of asking that critical question. Then we would also start wondering who who are the serious criminal. You know, uh, is there a chance for the the question of second chance back into society? You know, so if we get involved in prisoners rehabilitation reintegration, there would be a different appetite for interest. All this why nobody bothers about the prison. You you know, however, the prison department work hard, suffer in that environment. No one cares, you know. But now, uh, rightfully so, people are worried that it may be abused. So I think the first is to give more information. And PBSL, uh, this early uh, release uh, initiative, uh, is a committee, formal committee chaired uh, by the director general, has been around for many years. You know, we just probably never knew about it. Uh, and they've been doing uh, work to not release people because they like to release, but they find it in a systematic way to ensure people who are their tail end of sentencing and have no, no uh, flight risk, uh, no risk to society. Uh, they, so, so the criteria for, for orientation and assessment is done very thoroughly. You have to prove that you are well behaved in prison. And I learned this while I was there. They have a, I mean, I forget the term, but it's like A, B, C, D, E. You have to go through from your week one to the end. And they check on that. You know, if you have even a smallest infraction of behavior, you won't qualify. You'll just be kicked out of the list, you know. So the internal uh, uh, integration, discipline, food practice, uh, and all that is taken into account before somebody is brought. To uh, this committee, but I think for lack of information, most of us fear that the prison department director general will get a call to say, "Oh, you know, do something." You know, and I think he has uh, to defend the integrity of his office, his role and responsibility, as he's mandated by the Prison Act to 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 play this role. And uh, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, with the changing tide and mood in Malaysian society, uh, I think which is a very positive thing. Uh, from a common person like you and me, Melissa, but I think you are not too common, but uh, <laughs> uh, to others like uh, uh, former prime minister, we are all subject to the same scrutiny, the same courage and strength of the court to decide if we are guilty of any crime, and we will end up in prison if we have committed a crime. I think that's a trajectory that anyone will go through, and the other end, the releasing part, should also follow the same trajectory of anybody, the, as I mentioned, the drug abuser, the minor theft, uh, you know, uh, abuser. You will have to go to that end of the committee to follow the same criteria. But I think lack of information, and I really call on KDN and maybe the prison's director general to to furnish this available read, readily. There's nothing secret about uh, how the committee works. I mean, you don't have to reveal who comes to the committee, but the criteria, so that we will be confident that there will be. Uh, little space or no space for abuse. Right. Gerald, thank you so much for speaking with me. Always insightful to tap your, your knowledge. Appreciate your time. That was Gerald Joseph, Chair of CSO Platform for Reform. We're going to take a quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. <music> Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Let's continue our discussion about the Licensed Release of Prisoners Initiative or Home Detention to which the government has agreed in principle to implement. What safeguards and oversight is necessary for its successful implementation? Well, let's ask our next guest, lawyer and activist Chong Kayan. She's a partner at YH Boo and Partners. Uh, Kayan, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Um, as a lawyer uh, with some experience in human rights advocacy, may I ask you what your initial uh, thoughts are on this um, 
initiative, the license release of prisoners initiative, particularly with regards to uh, the potential impact it might have on the rights of prisoners. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. It's my honor. It's my honor. Okay. Um, regarding the proposed license release of prisoner uh, initiative, um, the government actually has provided very limited details on how the PBSL will work, but it is not something new. The current PBSL scheme includes target specific groups like uh, those with chronic illness, chronic disease, the elderly, disabled individuals, and the expected mother. But recently, I understand that the government has agreed in principle to implement the PBSL. Uh, to be more specific, the prisoners uh, serving due time of four years and below, they will undergo home detention as a, as a very effort to reduce uh, overcrowding situation in prison. I myself, I welcome this initiative. I welcome it so much. But because it will not only address the overcrowding situation on the prison itself, but it also facilitates the reintegration of the image into the society. Mm -hmm. Specifically, uh, after the recent abolishment of the death penalty and the introduction of the Resentencing Act, the former death row inmates a whole sentence were committed to 30 to 40 years, and they might have a few months or even few years left in the prison. So it is crucial for those who have served their extensive periods and are nearing uh, out of the end of their sentence. It is a very good opportunity to allow them to reconnect with family and adjust themselves or familiarize themselves with the society. Okay, so so you say this is a step in the right direction, but what needs to be in place to make sure that this initiative is effective in practice? So, in my opinion, for the practice to be effective, I think well, we do not have much uh, details regarding the plan, but I feel like the government must engage with the stakeholders, especially the NGO, such as Kakase, Haya, they work on the abortion of death penalty for many years, the family members of the inmates, and of course, the formal inmates uh, in have the government to design an effective framework, and maybe yeah, even they have uh, they can engage with Sohakam to monitor the human rights compliance. Uh, but essentially, essentially, I urge the government, and I would very much emphasize on this point. I hope the government can set out a clear standards and transparent policy and guideline to determine the eligibility of the inmates. I feel like this is very crucial to award PBSL as a special privilege exclusive for VVIP or politicians to get benefit or manipulate from the scheme. So okay. I think it should be fair and accessible for all. Right. I, I, I get what you're alluding to and I'm, so I'm just going to ask the question. Uh, we know there are concerns over Najib Razak's judicial uh, review leave to, uh, application to allow for him to serve the remainder of his jail term under house arrest. Um, I, I, there have been many comments made about that. So I'm asking what you would like to see to prevent those very abuses that you, you mentioned earlier um, for, for manipulation of this initiative for the privileged. What safeguards and oversight would you like to see in place, Kayan? All right. If if you are talking about a fair scheme available to all, available to those who is eligible, it is very hard for us to exclude, for example, Najib specifically from the scheme. It's very hard for us to exclude him. But rather, I hope that it would be a fair, a standard scheme available to to those who are eligible to make sure that not only VIP benefited from the scheme, rather than we exclude him, I hope that this scheme will be a more inclusive and accessible one. Okay, all right. Are there potential risks? Are you concerned that uh, if, if the implementation of home detention for those certain categories um, are not properly um, executed, implemented, are there potential risks associated with the PBSL program? I understand where the public comes from. I understand they have they might have concern about potential risks of the initiative, but it is not for me to to give a conclusive uh, a conclusion or a summary, and it is not possible to completely predict or negate all risks. But I would just like to point out that actually the federal court takes into account of all the factors, including the characters and the behaviors of the inmate, while the federal court deciding on the sentencing of those on death row or those serving life imprisonment. So the careful consideration, the scrutinization, the process ensure that only those deemed suitable for release are considered. Um, I have a very assuring statistic. Um, to be more specific, 
the parliamentary answer from the Home Minister to YB Rao Chow Yi Hui in maybe 11th of October last year. Uh, there's a data from Jabatan Penjara, Malaysia, which saying that no death row inmates who have been granted pardon and released from the prison are recorded as being rearrested in prison. But I understand that we could not negate all the risks, but this is a very assurance that is again uh, on our future direction. Okay, so so you said that it's you you understand the concerns of the risk. But I want to focus on that the public's reaction to this. If it is going to be implemented and implemented well, you need public buy-in. What steps do you think the government should take to ensure that there is public acceptance, there's public understanding over this initiative? The skepticism. Okay, so uh, I I understand the public reaction. There might be some uh skepticism from the public, but, uh, potentially concerning those high-profile beneficiary. So I feel like it is important for the lawmakers, for example, the MPs, to use this as an opportunity to address some other broader issues, such as prison overcrowding, human rights, and whether the scheme is accessible and transparent, rather than we just focus on larger things. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you know if um, uh, there are other countries that we can look to? I mean, I'm not sure how many countries um, practice home detention or early release on license, but are there best practices or experiences or, or lessons that we can take from other countries' experiences that have similar prisoner release programs that Malaysia is looking at that we could learn from uh, and maybe improve our version of home detention? I am not an expert in foreign jurisdiction, but I see there are some countries, for example, Taiwan, they have this uh, legal arrangement in which a person who has been found guilty, uh, they, they are not sentenced to jail immediately, but maybe they, uh, they may be sentenced in a future time. For example, there's a probation period. If you commit a crime in a probation period, you may be arrested again. But if you, you're a good boy, you're a good girl, you're behaving in this probation period, then you are, you are a free person. So perhaps we can take this as a lesson. So to strike a balance between uh, the interests of all parties, the government can maybe set a probation period. If the inmate breach any of the reasonable terms, of course, the reasonable terms and conditions imposed by the authority, uh, they might be arrested. So we could look into those models, for example, Taiwan's deferred sentencing models, to provide a probation period uh, during which the re-arrest can occur to strike a balance between all parties and maybe to give assurance to, to the public regarding the initiative. Right. Okay, that's that's interesting. I mean, we should be thinking about other models or thinking about other ways we can reform our uh, prison system. Can I ask you, based on the work that you've been doing, your advocacy work, your activism work, uh, what do you think Kayan, are or should be the key priorities for Malaysia when it comes to prison reform? Uh, what, what would you like to see prioritised? Okay, from my personal experience, sometimes because we do not have much engagement with the inmates of those in the prison or those who work in the industry, who work in the policy itself, so we might be very skeptical and we might think that, oh, they are all like bad, big devil, and we often neglect what are the situations they, they face in the prison itself, for example, the overcrowding issue, the food, the health care, and etc. Et for example, the whole woman inmate, whether they have enough, um, menstrual product for them, uh, for demonstration and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I feel like uh, there's, we, should have, we should have more engagement between the prison and also the public regarding what is actually happening in the prison itself for, to us, uh, for us to moving forward towards a better uh, a prison condition. Do you think there's a role for legal professionals um, and you know, uh, activists or human rights advocates in um, educating or uh, making or bridging that gap in, in knowledge? Is there a role for the wider society to play? Uh, our role are actually very limited compared to government and MPs and, and, and the prison authority. But what we can do is we educate and we raise awareness for the public what's happening in the prison. Are they even very big devil people or they are actually uh, uh, repenting and turning into a in this in the prison itself. So I feel like the awareness is the only the only role that we can play. We have limited role. So I hope and I urge the government to to bring in this gap together. All right. Thank you so much, Kayan, for speaking with me. That was lawyer and activist Chong Kayan, and that wraps up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris signing off for the evening. 
Thank you so much for watching and good night.